This conference will now be recorded. So here's something that we probably all ran into when someone asked the question or makes a comment, cover crops won't work around here. And I wish I could have uh, know how many times that was asked, but it's certainly been um, significant over, over the years, that's for sure. <coughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, so um, this, this question is sometimes catches you by surprise and you're not sure how to answer. And I, I think it behooves us all to literally think this through when you're asked this question, because it is a moment sometimes where you could either turn someone off by your response totally, if they aren't ready, or you could kind of bring them back into uh, an opportunity maybe to use cover crops. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And just as a reminder too, that if you have something you want to write in the chat box, go ahead. I'll try to answer that as I go. Um, so uh, just something else I forgot to say earlier, but uh, either that, and then we'll have some questions later on. So a little bit about my experience in the context of this question. I've been around, a lot of you know that, I've been most of the U.S. and Canada. I've been to Australia a couple times, six European countries in South Africa. Over 30 countries have visited my farm here in southeastern Pennsylvania. So when you have a question like cover crops won't work around here, I think it would be accurate to say that every place I've been, every place I've been in all these countries, all the people who have visited my farm, everybody would know someone who would say that cover crops don't work in that area. So what is the difference then of why some people are making them work and other people aren't? And we have touched on this on different times, different webinars. There's some, there is some overlap here on like how to talk to your neighbors about cover crops. And, and, uh, but I'm going to, I tried to have fresh material in this conversation, this topic today. So just, again, understanding my background and where I'm coming from, I think it is important. Now, I will tell you that I think I did find a place where cover crops may not work. Uh, this was the picture taken five days ago from the, the thing that landed on Mars. And if you're keeping up with the news at all, last week, they had this fantastic experience of landing into Mars. And I saw these pictures and I'm thinking, you know what? Pretty tough there to grow cover crops. So if you're from Mars, I get it. Cover crops probably won't work, at least with what we know now, what we understand. Who knows someday? But uh, that's the only excuse I'm really going to uh, agree to, I guess, at this point. So getting into a little bit more of the specifics, I think it's always important that we understand a little bit about backgrounds and and so forth and then some of the social dynamics of answering a question like this because it can get heated it can get controversial um it can be just people just disagree and people legitimately have incidents where they have cover crops have not worked so my first kind of more of an overview into this topic is saying about how you react, what your response is when someone says cover crops don't work around here. It's the foundation for a respectful continued discussion. That's what I want to set up uh, where we can continue the discussion. So you're not going to convince everyone. I'm going to show you a picture here soon of just that demonstrates that. But just understand that you're not going to convince everyone. And I feel that the goal is to move a doubter or someone who does have a glimmer of hope that they're willing to talk to move them one step in the direction of potentially using cover crops. That to me is a very simple reasonable goal and it is an it is an attitude and it will come through your voice your tone of voice as you literally talk to people email them whatever 
But I would also say don't waste your time on someone who is just not interested in learning. Um, it's just it's just not worth it. So just leave those people go. There are plenty of people out there who want to learn to know how to do cover crops. Also, you need to acknowledge and understand that their reasons for failure, if they've tried it, or if they've heard it doesn't work in their area, they're probably correct. And again, this is kind of the, the attitude, the tone that comes through, because they may have tried cover crops. We all have done cover crops and had failures, right? So we could all say cover crops don't work. But the point was, what did we learn from that experience in order to actually make them work later on? And that's the important thing here to understand in all this. So um, just also, again, big picture here, the underlying questions to cover crops don't work around here usually fall back to two, two main items. And the one of them is, do cover crops pay? And uh, the other one is, there just is no planting window. So most of the reasons cover crops don't work or people say they don't work comes down to those two categories. Again, it's important to understand that. So when people ask that, you can be thinking in the back of your mind, this is probably ultimately what they are referring to. And it's just helpful then as you begin the discussion. What I would like to do in our time together today is to look at a five different scenarios of what could happen in each of our, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week activities of, of addressing this question. So I'm going to start out with scenario number one. Let's just say that you're new to the area. Uh, you're you're out traveling about. You're you know you're not you're not around home. Uh, you're with people you don't know. So these are strangers, uh, because it does make a little difference how you approach this. Uh, this this could be at a at a large conference, a meeting. Um, you know, and so forth. I'm going to lay out some other scenarios that could overlap in this. But what I have found to be useful, um, if if I'm in an area that I'm unfamiliar with, is just if I, you know, see a farmer or something, I'm like, ask the question, do you know anyone around here using cover crops? Now, this could be prefaced by, you know, the conversation could be uh, already brought up. But let's just say you're starting cold and we're not even, you know, there to the question yet. The response when you say, do you know anybody around here using cover crops could be, well, they don't work around here. And um, so then you you go back and you you ask, is anybody using cover crops in this area? And more, more chances than not, they will probably know of someone who at least tried them. Uh, so you, you just follow up with some questions. Well, how are they making them work? Uh, have you ever uh, tried cover crops yourself? What was your experience? And you, know, you can phrase these questions, whatever is comfortable for you. But these are the kind of things in the discussion that you want to you wanna stay away from, um, you know, just some – just this oblivious thing of they don't work. You want to get to the, the 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 real reason to try to get down to the real reason why they're thinking the way they think. So you can then build up off of that. One of the m- most uh, effective ways is to ask, do you know of a neighbor or someone who seems to be successful in using cover crops? I have used this question quite often. And I have yet, I have yet to meet a farmer who has said they don't know of anybody that, that they don't know of anybody who is not using, successfully using cover crops. Now, it may not be in their direct neighborhood, but again, it's a way to launch out of that and to, to continue the discussion. And in all these scenarios here, um, if they're just not interested, like I said before, you know, you just kind of wrap up the conversation and walk away. The point is you want to leave the door open for further discussion because I have been amazed how many people have told me that they don't work. And then I see them one, two, three, or five years later, and they say, you know what? We're figuring some stuff out here. I think they're working. So so that is, uh, you know, to me is, is, is very uh, 
it's it's very encouraging when you meet those people. Okay, let's go with scenario number two. This is someone you know. And this is probably a little bit more popular for most of us. It might be at a coffee shop, a local meeting. It's someone you know. And you may know, you may be well aware of what they've done. And, and again, I put this list of questions to ask up here. You know, you, you, you need to use them in your, your voice, the way you ask them. Um, so, you know, first of all, if the topic comes up, cover crops don't work, you're sitting at the local coffee shop. And so you just say, so uh, talk to me about that. I saw that field you had over there and, you know, it looks like you're trying to cover crops and, and you know, how that work out or what happened. And, and get them to explain and then follow up with questions like this. What were you expecting? Uh, I'll just give you a quick example. When I was in the radish business, uh, selling a tillage radish, a lot of people would plant them later and their the radishes would only be one inch in diameter. Well, based on the pictures and marketing and everything, they wanted a two inch diameter radish that was coming out the ground. They're like, why didn't this radish grow bigger and all that stuff? And I'm like, well, when did you plant it? Okay, well, that's why it didn't grow as big, but a one inch diameter radish still did a lot of good. And once you explain that to them, they understand it, but they thought that that was a failure because it was less than what they were expecting. And then just another follow-up question. So what would you do different? What, and it comes back with the next one there. What did you learn from this experience? So what you wanna do is you're trying to bring them back in to the discussion, try to stimulate their thinking. And it's interesting, <laughs> more so than not, I have heard some, they've answered their own question. Uh, they basically answer their own question why it didn't work. Like one person, when I say, what would you do different? Well, I plan them sooner. Well, that's a typical answer that I get, why cover crops didn't work. They, they didn't get them planted soon enough. Well, most of us realize this year is a tough year to do that. And we got to give everybody a pass in that, in that for this year. But some years, there's no excuse. Or you didn't prioritize it enough. So what did you learn from that experience? They might say, you know, I'm going to follow the combine with a drill. I'm going to use a neighbor to custom plant my cover crops. And, and so just to be able to help them through that is important. And to ask questions um, that, that kind of address how can you build on that? How can, you, how can you improve from what you learn? And then I have down here, when you're talking with people you know, um, at, at least for me, I value friendship more than being right. Not all of us are wired that way, uh, but I live with my neighbors all the time, and uh, I, you know, I deal with them. I we buy things from each other, we sell things from each other, and um, so you know, I have to keep that in mind. So I have down here, if it's appropriate, just share a success that you had in cover crops. Um, you know, I planted cereal rye and. It was before soybeans, and wow, we got great weed control and the soybeans, they did really good. I think I got a higher yield. Just something very general um, like that to kind of plant the seed, if you will, of a local success. But don't go on and on and on just lecturing them how great these cover crops are. Uh, generally, if you start with the conversation of cover crops don't work, you're not gonna get that far in one conversation. So that's why I said, my in my opening here the goal here is to take people one step in the direction of considering or reconsidering the use of cover crops again it's not to have them go out and plant their whole farm and cover crops next year we wouldn't want that um so that's just again you know a little bit of advice and and some of this is psychological but you know if we want to be effective we have to uh think about that um, now, I mentioned here about uh, people that you know and so forth uh, and, and how you deal with the neighborhood and all. Well, I have my next door neighbor there on the left. Cover crops, for whatever reason, don't work on his farm. Um, you have some other farms there. I have showed this picture before, another situation, but... You know, I'm not going to beat him over the head about how he should use cover. He sees what I do. He knows what he's I do. And this is the neighbor whose son says when he gets to take over the farm, he wants to talk to me. So I have kept the door open for the next generation. 
in this case. Uh, and that's the whole point of what I'm trying to say here in, in the way we relate to people. So as I say, stated earlier too, a lot of the motivation for people in saying cover crops don't work is that they don't see how they can pay. And um, every one of us has probably asked that question, uh, right? I mean, you know, we're, maybe that's so far back that you forgot about it. And you're so committed now that, you know, you kind of forgot. But I believe every one of us have asked that question very seriously. I certainly did in 1995 when I was speaking in Maryland. I asked the question in my talk. At that time, it was a no-till talk. I was really in a no-till. Cover crops were just a you know, sidebar, if that. And I made, made the question, if you no-till long enough, I don't really know if cover crops pay. And that's when Dr. Weil came to me and uh, from University of Maryland and said, would you like to start a uh, some research and answer this question. So the picture in the upper left-hand corner was uh, the first year of 12 years of research where we kept cover crops out of 15 by 100 foot, 150 foot uh, sections there and, and did the research on that. And on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the differences that we started seeing very rapidly in the soil. So it was four years later in 1999, we had a drought and I got 28 bushels more of corn where we had put cover crops the previous four years. See, that question was answered for me back then on my farm. I've never asked that question anymore, do cover crops pay? So my challenge uh, in understanding the motive behind people asking this is to try to help farmers understand that you're gonna to have to experience this at some point and know they may not pay every year. I think you just gotta acknowledge that, but you have to look at it more from a 10 year plan, a 10 year approach uh, is important. And I'm gonna be addressing this a little bit more later on. So I'll kind of leave that right now, but that's my story. That's literally my story. So when, when farmer, if that question ever comes up, they don't, they don't pay, I can, I can literally say, I asked the exact same question. Uh, and people find that hard to believe because I've been preaching this for 25 years, but that's the, that's the story that I can share. Let's move on to the next scenario. Scenario number three. This is when you're speaking. Some of us are speakers. I, I see some people on here right now that I know are, are, are in the speaking circuit and speak. And, you know, depending on the size of the audience, the size of the crowd, whatever, um, you can have someone, you can be into your talk and someone can say, you know, hey, uh, I, I don't see that cover crops pay. I like the story and everything. You know, I believe in cover crops, but I, I don't see how they can pay on my farm. And this is where um, you can say, like I just said, yeah, I, I had asked that same question too. So you're in, in a, when you're in a public venue, you don't have time to get in details. And that's why I want to suggest don't get, don't get sidetracked in details. You can talk to that person later on. But just acknowledge that uh, you had a, a similar question before on, on that. And uh, depending on the venue, depending how small it is, how big it is, you, is, you can decide where to go with that question. If you kind of know where that person's coming from or not, you can do that. Now, I see um, Dan Towery's on this call. And Dan, uh, you might remember this. Uh, this was 2012 in uh, Iowa where... Uh, Dan and I were uh, invited in for a private meeting. Uh, so you remember that, Dan? I, I, I see you're on here. It is uh, <laughs> scarred into my brain. I will never forget it. Yes. So I will share the experience briefly with that. That was the toughest crowd I think I've ever spoken to. It was I'm a glad. private event. It, yeah, right. Uh, invitation only. And uh, and the the whole thing was there was interest there by one of the farmers to to basically take him. He he was going to give cover crops a shot, but he wanted us to come in there. It was actually Dan and I and to talk about cover crops. And I don't think I was four or five minutes into my presentation, and one guy just shouted out. He said, "Hey, forget the BS. I just want to know." if cover crops are gonna pay. 
or a question very similar to that. And it kind of took kind of took me back because it was very straightforward and yeah, it was a small group and and so forth. But I do remember my response, um, uh, and it wasn't you know I, I certainly wasn't really re ready for it. But um, I'm thinking we're in the richest soil in the world almost. The top soil is three feet deep or more here, and you know I can't really talk about the benefits of organic matter and increasing yields and stuff like that. That's just going to fall on deaf ears. So I said, what is the parts per million of nitrates coming out of your tile lines? And the farmer responded, it's between 24 and 27 parts per million, which is it's fairly high. And then I responded back, I said, who paid for those nitrates? Well, obviously the answer was that he did. Um, but his comment was, if uh, I am being told not to use as much nitrogen, I'm going to fight it. So that was the comment that was given. And, and I thought, wow, that's, um, that's digging, in, digging in your heels pretty hard there. So uh, and, and it, it was just on. an interesting event. Go ahead, Dan. And just to throw in, put it in perspective, this was a, a fresh fish fry supper. Uh, yep. Lots of Jack Daniels being consumed. That is probably good to mention that there was other influences probably there. Um, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> it was a challenging meeting. Now, the good news is, and Dan, you may have seen this picture, but uh, this is um, Tib Wrecker, whose farm we were on. Um, actually, now he has become somewhat of a, I can truly say, a cover crop spokesman in that area. And, I think and, in the context of, and actually, yeah, go ahead, Dan. It was, it was, it was, I, I took this picture, so. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, now I can give you a photo credit. I just took this off the, the internet somewhere yeah. in an article. Well, Dan, what, you, you've been out there, so tell us what's going on in that area right now, because this... I mean, would, wouldn't you agree that we went there in 2012? Basically, cover crops don't work here, but we'd like to hear a little bit more. I don't know why, but um, well, yeah, I mean, tell yeah, us, tell, tell your version of it. This, this is an area, uh, uh, seed corn production, uh, mm -hmm. which my contract, they were required to put on the same amount of nitrogen as in the commercial corn, even though it only yields half as much. But, you know, that's, that's part of seed mm -hmm. corn production. Mm -hmm. And... It was, we went in with the idea, well, okay, he's got no experience with cover crops, no experience with no-till, so we'll go with mm -hmm. radishes and oats, make it simple. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, again, tried a couple of different techniques, but had challenges getting radishes established after seed corn for a variety of reasons. And, uh, it, anyway. It developed that Tim, on his own, and I'm sure with consultation with others, mm -hmm. uh, used, went to cereal rye and basically uh, uh, set up uh, a skip row drill to plant the cereal rye so we can still have the bare strips to come back and plant in between the, the strips of cereal rye. And this was, his his um, system and mm -hmm. he developed and and that it, it, it's expanding like nobody's business. So, yeah, and it's Iowa. <laughs> it's Iowa. Yeah, yes. Central yeah. Iowa. So so I, I want to share this story uh, as a success story uh, where the the that just. You know, when we went there in 2012, I don't think there was a cover crop within, I don't know how many miles of there, right? I mean, there just wasn't. Well, it, it was part of the mindset was that, that yeah. the first year. I mean, it was, Tim was like, you know, this is not natural. The fields aren't supposed to be green. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So, right. And his, and his yep. brother was even more adverse that it was. Yep. Fields should be black in the, in the fall. Yep. Yep. So, well, anyway, I want to share that story uh, with you. And there's a few other things here that um, you can do when you're in a public setting. Uh, and I always try to include this slide. It's one of my slides that make it to most of my presentations because it kind of diffuses 
some of the, um, I guess you say some of the people who are really dug in against cover crops, where you can say the cover crops are a simple concept, um, but they're very complex to be successful. And right there, no one is going to challenge that, either new people or veterans. Uh, and, and then to follow up, they're only a tool. Success is based on management. And that's just one of those one of those things there that keep memorize this in your mind. How would you say this when you're in a conversation with people? Uh, and, and even, you know, if you only have a couple seconds with someone and they say, you know, cover crops don't work. You're like, yeah, I understand that. But boy, they're they're really a simple concept. But it, it it's a lot of complexity to be successful. And and it's really how you manage them. And, and again, you have to take it from there. But this that is just something that is, I think, it's been very helpful for me. Um, the other thing, too, that I have been starting to share more and more with people who are receptive to the idea of a conversation is that um, I have found, and you can share it this way, I have found that most people who are successful with cover crops have some mentor or someone they follow. I mean, you guys that are on this call right now, just think of people's names that you either follow or talk to. And uh, I bet every one of us has someone in mind because that's how we learn. It's more than just going to a meeting and listening to someone speak. So I'm talking about what happens outside meetings and so forth. So one of those, again, if someone is, is you kind of brought them back to the point where they're willing to talk about cover crops and you can say, hey, you know, who is doing what you want to do? Uh, and, and maybe you can flesh that out and talk about it. Or I like to say also connect with the connectors. Uh, talk with people who are connected to other people that may be able to help you or even ask them. I mean, once you start getting out and about, um, going to some meetings and you start to piece together the people who are somewhat like-minded or have a like uh, operation that you do and you start connecting with them. And uh, this follow-up statement here, you can educate a person. In other words, you can get all full knowledge, but you can't necessarily make them think. When, but when you have a mentor relationship, that takes this knowledge a step further. And that's why I think it's very important in this, with our topic today of people who don't think cover crops work is to say, hey, if you're interested in trying again, you know, find somebody to make, find someone to connect with. Uh, and, and you'll, you'll again, it'll certainly set you up for more success. Um, again, I'm going to share something else that I think is very effective. There's nothing new, but boy, this really, really is effective. When you say, treat your cover crops like your cash crops, and my follow-up statement is, you will stand a much better chance of success. And any farmer can relate to this. And I always usually think of some example for the audience, whoever it is, but a very popular one is you would be out of your mind not to have your corn planter ready to go the first day it's fit to plant. Do you have the same amount of effort putting into cover crops? Planter ready, seed ordered, ready to go, hired people ready to go, whatever. Do you have a plan in place? All those things. And that, that is unarguable. You can't argue this statement. And this, again, literally helps people get in the right mindset to be able to uh, to kind of take another shot at uh, maybe cover crops in their area. And we're, we're constantly learning more and more as the momentum continues to grow. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to get easier, but there's more information out there. Uh, scenario number four, and this is uh, involves what I said is kind of the other big reason why there is resistance to cover crop is there just simply is no planting window, or maybe I should say no perceived planting window. Uh, we, we get in our little bubbles. We all know this. And I like to use the, the statement cover crops are not the missing puzzle piece. You may have to rearrange the picture. Now, there are some cases where they're relatively easy to fit into rotation, but we're not going to talk about that today because we're talking about people who, you know, basically just don't see um, a window of opportunity. Um, so uh, I have listed a, for a few things down there in, in certain situations that can apply. 
uh, interseeding, like planting into corn, has shown to work particularly in, in more northern climates. Uh, relay cropping, uh, planting before one cash, like into one cash crop, uh, and you could do this even with multiple cash crops, or companion cropping, planting with other species. We're not going to talk about all this stuff today. I'm just bringing out some uh, some ideas here. Also, instead of fallow, this is in the dry areas where typically they may only plant every other year, but we're finding out that having a cover crop planted in that off, in that off year lowers soil temperatures, um, keeps the biology active. The, the big thing against that is, oh, it's going to use up my water. Well, um, go back and look at my webinar that I talked about using cover crops in dry rainfall areas, and I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, the other thing is rotational cropping with cover crops. And this probably doesn't apply to a lot of us, but I just wanted to run by a few scenarios, real world scenarios that I have uh, been a part of myself and seen, uh, just to show you some of the creativity that goes on and some of the way of rearranging the picture, if you will, to make cover crops work. Um, this picture here is, is actually not with rotating with uh, cash crops, but this is up in the Peace River Valley on uh, in central western Alberta. I was just up there three weeks ago. Uh, I did not take this picture then. Obviously, this was taken during the summer. Um, and, and this brings up a great point here where when, when you're thinking about where cover crops, you know, people say they don't work, what are the advantages of any given area? A lot of times, all we talk about is a different disadvantage. This is why they won't work. Well, the you could say a disadvantage in this area, this far north, is that they have a very short growing season, literally three months max without potential frost. So that there's no corn and soybeans growing up there. There's a little corn grown for grazing, but uh, maybe some silage, but very little. Um, so, but what do they have that a lot of us don't have? They have very long days of sunlight in the summer, so they can grow lots of forage. And the cover crops actually really, really grow phenomenally in a short amount of time. And this is something that it was just interesting for me to see and observe. Now, this picture I did take three weeks ago, um, and I'll just show you here. This represents why they use cover crops in north or central western Alberta is that they have this super uh, long days where they can grow tremendous amounts of forage. So they're using uh, these forages that, that can put on tremendous amount of tonnage in a short time. Of course, they're, they're, there's a lot of cattle in this area, and that's the reason why, because they can grow a lot of forage uh, in, in such a short amount of time. So they a lot of the guys are grazing them in the summer, and then they're, they're cutting and bailing for winter. Um, for winter feeding. So this is just the way this area has adapted to using cover crops. And I found it fascinating to, to be up there and, uh, and just see that and experience how they're actually doing it. Now, we can also go to the other end of the extreme here. And uh, I mentioned rotational cropping. And what I mean by that is in this scenario here, this is Zambia, Africa. And they actually get a decent amount of rainfall on an annual basis, but they have three months that's very, very, very dry, no rainfall at all. And um, this guy, Adrian here, who I met when I was in South Africa, he came down and actually was one of the speakers. Uh, Zambia is more in Central Africa. But he has actually increased his farm yields, his overall farm yields, by idling one-third of his land and pl essentially planting cover crops. And he has this three-year rotation now, and the yields are so much higher, and his costs are lower. He's getting weed control, and he's getting he's getting uh, some fertility out of these legumes here. He's growing corn and soybeans. Um, so in his situation, this is working. Probably ain't going to work in many other places in the world. But everybody around him is saying cover crops don't work. He's making it work. And uh, it's just a fantastic story. I mean, this guy keeps track of numbers and everything. And it was just an interesting um, thing. And I just want to show you that 
that, that you got to keep thinking for your area. Um, and when you talk to people, I know that most of us here are committed, but still, how do you share with people? How do you stimulate them with ideas and so forth? So here's my final scenario. We're going to stop for questions for everybody. But scenario number five is uh, how do you take the conversation further if they kind of swing back and show some genuine interest? Because that's going to occur if you lay the foundation for keeping an open door and keeping the discussion open. So some of the first questions you need to ask are what do they want to accomplish? And uh, for the sake of today's topic, I'm not going to go into all that. I'm just, you, you know how to answer that. And then when is your planting window? For some of these people you may know, they may be your neighbors and you understand that you know what they do, but you know, whoever you're talking to, these are the first two questions you ask and then you can kind of work from there. And then also just to encourage them to go to a field day or a meeting. Um, some people just don't do that very often and, and especially to a field day where they can actually see soil pits and roots and stuff. I know for me, that impacted me. I just didn't know much about the underground. and to see what was going on, to see how deep cover crops roots grow. And uh, like the picture there on the right, you can see the mycorrhizal fungi on the roots of a sorghum sedan uh, plant. Uh, it's just really cool to see some of that stuff and, and that helps you understand what cover crops can do. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share those things with you, but also, I, I need to wrap this up here by giving the perspective that you just don't throw on cover crops and expect miracles. Uh, some of us get a little bit over exuberant sometimes on what all they can do. You had a you had an awesome um, you know experience. I'm I'm I've literally been sitting at some cover crop meetings and and I see you know uh, someone who's a you know pretty good speaker. They got natural talent and they're talking about this one year miracle they had and I'm thinking oh boy. Um, that's, that's, you're, you're putting yourself out there because that may not ever happen again. And, and again, it, it might, but I'm just saying, you know, in the context of how popular cover crops have gotten, sometimes that kind of stuff turns off people. And so I just want to put that out there, uh, as we're sharing, as we're talking, as we're influencing, uh, those around us. So what questions do you have, uh, related to this topic? Um, I'm on muting everybody, so uh, I would love to hear questions. I also like to hear comments and uh, conversations, or how maybe experience how you have addressed this question of cover crops won't work around here. So, who wants to be first? John, I see you have your mic on. Um, got a lot of background noise coming out of yours, but uh, do you have anything to say? John, I want to make sure I give you a chance. Cause, uh... I, I turned off my furnace and everything. I, I wonder if, it, if I have a, a bad uh, microphone. Um, but uh, okay. I, I just set a good example. There's a, a whole generation or two that came out of Ohio State, and they learned that soil holds up plants, and you put your inputs in, and that's it. And, and them guys, um, they, they've got a bunch of rots out in their field now because they're still combining soybeans in, in uh, tilled soil. And they're not very yep. happy, but I, I don't think that they've seen the light yet. Yep, 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 clear. Uh, Dan, go ahead, Dan. I see you have your mic on, Dan. Did you want to uh, respond? Oh, well, I guess. The, oh, there I hear you. The, the, yeah, the, the biggest challenge, I think, is what I see right now is, you know, again, if the plan is to get the cover crops on after a harvest, I mean, this, this year is a right. example. We still got yep. rocks out of, out of the field. Uh, mm -hmm. Find that with uh, much cooler, wetter uh, mm -hmm. fall than, than normal. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the things I very gently try to do is let's look at some of the, the folks who are successful. Uh, mm -hmm. What are they doing? Different, and, and they don't. And mm -hmm. Farmers are modest. They don't boast about it. And they just, you know, but you know, if, if a lot of the guys are doing mm -hmm. using the high boy, uh, going in and and, and late August, early September, aerial season. Right. Uh, 
don't manage all of your cover crops the same. Um, have a diversified oh. system for what you're going to plant and when you're going to plant. Uh, and some are going to, you know, you know again, it's kind of like the old adage, you know, don't, uh -huh. don't be up at that. And the idea is trying to, trying to get a home run every time. It mm -hmm. just doubles. Yep. And, uh, right. And you will, long term, it will, it will work out for you much better. Uh, yep. But to yep. get their arms around uh, having multiple ways of doing it, and, and again, they don't all have to do it themselves. I mean, they're like the mm -hmm. uh, high clearance equipment. You know, four or five guys go together, they can share that and, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, make it work. I know it sounds easy, yep. but it, it, it's all the devil's mm -hmm. in the details. But I, I see that as yep. being one of the big uh, stumbles mm -hmm. that we have. Yeah. And I got to use yeah. an analogy, Steve, with when we first uh -huh. started with cover covers. Farmers experience. I mean, I worked with growers who did not, had never planted wheat. It was never planted yep. a small grain, corn and soybean, for yep. all that they knew. And yet we had to set aside acres. So you're required to put a cover on it. So yeah. going out in July and seeing a half bushel of oats. To uh -huh. check the box with FSA that a cover crop has been planted. Yeah. Uh, yep. No, that's 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 you, you, you gotta you gotta get in the ball game if you're gonna if you're gonna play. Uh, so. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure if everybody heard everything. Your microphone is a little weak, Dan, for whatever reason. But I, what I heard you say is it's been a tough. It's uh, we all know it's been a tough fall. It's been cold. It's been wet. It's been late. And uh, but still, to look for those who are successful long term, to see what they're doing. Some of them are planning earlier with high clearance vehicles and so forth. But um, I did appreciate. I wrote down what you said there that um, don't manage all your cover crop acres the same. I think that's. That's just some good advice um, out there that uh, it's, I, I never really heard it quite said that way before. So I might have to use that sometime, Dan. Well, uh, <laughs> I know. It's all fair. Yes, sir. Okay. Other people, com questions or comments on dealing with this or stories that you have, um, you know, tell, tell me. I see uh, – uh, Mr. Fletcher here. I had a combine friend of mine. I had a friend combine for me, and he had one of the best looking pinto bean fields around that the neighbors noticed. When he was on 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 mine, I, I knew mine was out yielding his because he became all questions like really quick. So you had seed, or I had seeded into tall rye. He liked the way the header slid and my weed control. Um, so uh, basically, just wrapping up what. What Fletcher said here, just the custom harvester, essentially, as I understand, has noticed the difference. I've heard this before. Um, I've heard this. I think Dave Brandt talked about this in Ohio, where uh, there were some custom guys that they noticed when they got on these bean fields where there was tall rye rolled down that uh, the head drove. I mean, just everything was so nice. The weeds were less and different things. So that's another way to convince people sometimes, just that show and tell how that works. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for writing that down. Uh, other people, comments, stories, suggestions, how do we deal with people who say cover crops won't work around here? Go ahead, Dave. I hear a lot about that planting window and the timing of planting uh, and seeding here in <laughs> Illinois, Southern Illinois. And you know, like this year, we was able to get in and drill and in my part of the world, uh, in other parts of the state, you know, it's pretty wet. But, you know, <clears throat> two, two different spectrums here. Some guys went in early in like the 1st of August with airplanes and tried to see their cover crop in the standing corn that yep. the corn wasn't at the right stage. And then they had a basically a failure, you know, and uh -huh. they're like, well, we don't have a good planning window. And if they would have waited, you know, two or three weeks, they would have had much better success. Uh, on right. the flip side of that, if we got later, we got wet, you know, you know, that's still a good time to be 
be running an airplane. If you can, you're not going to track up the field any and get it out there. Right. Uh, and, and there's so many times in the river bottoms around here that guys will fly on soybeans just because mm-hmm. it's too wet to get in uh, to be able to plant soybeans in the spring. Wow. So, you know, wow. there's a lot of opportunities out there. I think guys just, mm-hmm. they always look at the negatives or yeah. try to make up some excuses too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I just noticed, uh, I was reading through, uh, Bayer Monsanto produced uh, like 185 page uh, research book here this year. And there's two pages on cover crops and corn and mm-hmm. yields. And the, the big problem I see with that is, you know, they were doing a real, they didn't publish what rate they see their cereal rye, but they don't appear like there's any legumes. So, the, you know, there needs to be a concentration on kind of the carbon and nitrogen ratios there yep. of what mm-hmm. we're seeding prior to what crop. And they're talking about the yield mm-hmm. drag to seeding into mm-hmm. uh cereal rye and how it was managed you know and i see mm-hmm. that's the negative mm-hmm. stuff i wish would be better addressed mm-hmm. i guess because you know they're going to run out and uh the naysayers out there at the retail world or whatever that don't like cover crops mm-hmm. or mess with them will pick up on that and right. run with it yeah hmm well that's okay so they basically they gave a, a, a kind of a negative report on cover crops or cereal rye before corn is that what i'm hearing you saying well basically on uh, you know is looking at different termination you know between planting okay. green and, and and terminating it okay. later or yeah. terminating it two or three weeks before planting uh, mm-hmm. or going in there and working at the end and everything and, and looking at just your right. yield but not about net income mm-hmm. or anything of you know did we have to use less herbicide or how you know right we didn't right. use that tillage yeah. pass, so how much did that save us? Yeah. Right. Yeah, interesting. Okay, um, Lloyd, you were on there a little bit longer, I know, a little bit earlier. I don't know if you have something to say now or not, Lloyd. I know you're in the truck, but uh, you have a comment actually, or question? I'm at my destination. I, uh, I guess uh, just a general comment, you know, uh, when I started talking or thinking cover crops, you know, several years ago, I was thinking three, four, five-way mixes. And uh, mm-hmm. as you presented, I mean, you you were basically just saying, get something out there. And, uh, oh, yeah. and I think that might be the better approach uh, to mm-hmm. some of these guys instead of, you know, insisting that they drill and they do a three, four, five-way mix. Just, mm-hmm. just get mm-hmm. something out there and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even sell it as, uh, you know, well, if wheat goes up to 6 and 7 or $8, mm-hmm. why... Look, look at all this wheat you potentially could harvest. Yeah. No, there's different scenarios will definitely could align that will that will increase cover crop usage. They'll figure it out. And um, I'm going to be talking about that more in the new year, about how I see the market starting to mature, where it's going to pull cover crops through by incentivizing or requiring some sort of soil health procedures and growing our food and uh you know all that is going to enter in here that in this to this question but good point there lloyd about starting simple because uh, sometimes farmers eyes glaze over when they hear someone who did a 21 way mix of cover crops uh certainly not the simplest thing to start out with but uh you know there are some simple things i mean i think we all agree for for most uh farmers get cereal rye before beans uh, is probably the easiest thing there is to enter if you're a corn bean farmer. Um, and then there, you know, with corn, you, you, uh, you know, it depends where you're at, but, uh, you're going to have to adapt to your, but trying to give some ideas where you can, uh, is, is certainly important to help farmers actually to have something tangible that they can start with. So, okay. Anybody else? Our time's about up. Um, I don't want to go on, but I do want to allow for any, other people comments. Jack, do you have a comment from Iowa? Yeah, I, I would. And and I guess uh, I'd, I'd agree with the last speaker's uh, comments there, you know, just trying to get in years earlier, just try to get something started and, and perhaps start with something that will winter kill because I hear a lot of conversation mm-hmm. about they're really afraid of what's going to happen in the spring. And mm-hmm. yeah. not only that is I try to encourage them, you know, start small, you know, just pick, yeah. pick yes. uh, someplace mm-hmm. that you – uh, you don't lose the whole works on it if you 
make the wrong management decision and it turns right so great yep no good stuff i like that start small that's a another good uh kind of <laughs> it's just good sound advice um so i see john you're on here uh john yeah. johnson my neighbor or john okay john brand straighter go ahead john there's two johns on here now i had i had my best success ever with flowing on rye into my corn this year and i've made sure okay. that any any social media or anything like that i've got pictures of it out there i yeah. i sent pictures yeah. over to the uh soil and water people that arranged it and they can use it in their yeah. publicity i sent yeah. something over to the seed uh sales people so they can use it yeah. and it's a it's a good story. It doesn't happen that way right. every year, but right. it, uh, I think it's a it's a step in the right direction to keep the yep. the message out there. That's, that's all. Yep. Okay, let's let's switch back to John Johnson. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Any comments you have in this topic? Just keep planning. Just keep, keep planting. Going. Yep. Now We're I got. Are you, are you doing? Okay, so you're going right now. Okay, well, it was a little, so you're, it was, it was frosty enough around here that you're probably, it's going pretty good now, right? It's doing very well in these conditions. Well, that's good, that's good. So just, so the rest of you know, John's lives close to me here in Pennsylvania. We had about 22 degrees here this morning. And this in the soil, we right. haven't had rain for a couple days now, so... Unless you have wet spots, it's pretty good. To, it's a pretty good morning to plant cover crops. So way to go, John. You're walking the talk. Yes. That's good. Yeah, all right. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. Anybody else? Um, any comments, questions? Uh, I should tell you what we're going to talk about next week coming up here. But uh, anybody else? Comments? Okay. So next week. I'm going to uh, talk. Uh, I think this is a relevant topic here because we're in that in the meeting season now. Uh, five tips to get the most out of cover crop meetings, and you may you may think that that's a little bit simple, but there's some things you can do and some things that I've picked up over the years. I, I don't attend meetings with in the same way that I used to. Uh, there's some strategy when you attend meetings, particularly the bigger ones that are all day or multiple days, uh, but even small meetings, how do you maximize and get the most out of them? So that's what I'm gonna talk about next week. Um, I also want to follow up here and <clears throat> I'll give one more opportunity for any questions, but um, our friend from, uh, I guess from North Dakota, Fletcher, I want, he just, um, in the chat box here, said he flew on rape seed and with mixed with turnips and um that the rapeseed froze off but the turnips survived so he's glad he used a mix so there again is a good case in point for using a mix uh, because you never know what the weather is going to send your way so just another few tips or tricks of the trade if you will uh in that so okay one final time any more questions uh, about anything any cover crop question Okay, um, appreciate your conversation. Um, I just wanna encourage you to stay curious, keep learning, and uh, we'll make this world a better place. See you next week.